Hello, bird class. Oh, and Fidget says hello too. <laughs> Yeah, Fidget is definitely a cutie pie. Okay. Whoop. All right, so announcements. The project is due Sunday before midnight. If you're doing a presentation, I think we have only three people going, so you should expect to go on Tuesday next week. Are there any questions about the project? Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. Ah, can I go? Uh, yeah, okay. So um, I prefer in-text citations, but I'm not real strict about that. The part that I that uh, Shannon is asking about the crap worksheets. So these are, well, the crap worksheet is a simple document that gives you several different um, criteria that you can use to judge how reliable your sources are. So it's kind of a way to help you evaluate the quality of your sources. Or is, is this a reliable source or is it somebody's um, somebody trying to sell something, for example. You can either submit the worksheet or you can submit a summary of the worksheet. So ideally, you'll put everything in one document to submit it rather than having a whole bunch of them. So I've had a lot of students um, in my other classes who will put the criteria. Oh, the, let me rephrase this. Let me, let me write this. They'll go reference, Wikipedia, and they'll go criteria one, yes. Criteria two, yes. I forget the names of the criteria. Criteria three, no. Um, I mean, I know what the criteria are. I just don't remember the order that they go in. And that's fine. If that's what you want to do at the bottom of your document, that's all I need. PowerPoint. Um, if you're doing a PowerPoint, I'm expecting you to do it as a presentation. So those are going to be on Tuesday. You can't just, do you get points off if you don't submit the worksheets? Yes, you lose points for not submitting those. Yep. Anything else you guys can think about? Mary, go ahead. Hi, yeah, I already submitted mine, but all I did was put the websites. Okay, you might you want to go back and, and look at those crap worksheets and figure out if they, um, how they meet the criteria listed on those worksheets. Okay, thank you. You can still submit that. Okay. All right, you can always email me. Um, although Sunday I don't uh, check my email very often on the weekends. Um, yes, if you 
want to do a paper instead of a presentation, go right ahead. That works just fine. <clears throat> All right, so it is baby bird time. Mary, go ahead again. I'm sorry, what do you mean by criteria? Okay. Um, let me open up that worksheet. Oh, come on. Okay, where'd it go? There we go. All right. Let me switch the screen share so we can all look at the document. There we go. Okay. Can you see this? All right. So there's a series of questions here. The first part is how current is it? How up to date is this worksheet? Was the information published or updated recently? Yes or no? Is it recent enough? So some of your sources might be a little bit older, but given your topic, that may not be important. Um, if there are links on the website, do they work? Are they broken? Is the information supported by evidence? Does it have data in it? Does it have quotes? A lot of your sources might not have data specifically or references. Um, you know, if you use Wikipedia, it's gonna have those references. But that's okay if not every site does. Does it sound reasonable? Um, has it been reviewed? You may not know that. Have you seen the same information on each one? So you need to do this for three sources. If you have more sources, you don't have to do that for any of the others. What a lot of students have been doing is um, either just saying, you know, kind of giving the list of, of these criteria and saying yes or no, or actually copying this grid onto the back of their paper as a way to attach it. Ideally, you attach it to, this, to the paper, um, but if you need to, if you've already submitted your paper and you need to send it in a different way, you can certainly uh, fill it out, email me. Okay, does that answer? Looks like I've answered all the questions. Mary, are you good? Okay. All right. So, it's starting to be baby bird season. I think I've shown you this graphic before. Um, I really like this particular graphic. Tawny, yes, books are fine. <laughs> Not a problem there. Um, it's kind of a flow chart for determining what you need to do if you find what you think is a baby bird. Basically, most of the time, people who find baby birds are finding fledglings and they really don't need to be taken to a wildlife rehabber. At the most, they need to might need to be moved. So I think I mentioned to you guys, um, I had some birds nesting in a pot by my back door. The babies fledged, 
and one of them got stuck between the glass and the slide screen of the sliding glass door. And so I reached in, picked it up, carried it over and put it under a bush in another part of my yard. And that's fine. That's all you need to do most of the time. If it's been caught by a cat, it needs to go to rehab because they can get diseases from uh, cat wounds. Okay. Oh, right. We were still finishing up diseases. All right, so we've talked a lot about diseases that we see in pet birds and in um, chickens, which can be commercial or backyard flocks. But I want to mention a couple, oops, I want to mention a couple of diseases that happen in wild birds or a couple of problems, medical problems. The number one reason birds show up at a wildlife rehabilitator is cats. And I don't mean number one barely, I mean overwhelmingly. This is the problem. Cats catch wild birds. It can be as much as um, three quarters of all birds brought to rehabilitators are cat caught. And that's including people who find fledgling birds and pick them up and they don't need to be caught. Damage from a cat, there can be visible wounds, there can be damage to the internal organs. Um, there can also be bacteria from cat saliva getting into the wounds, which can cause infections. So usually these infections, by the time you see symptoms, it's too late. So any bird that is caught by a cat needs to be put on antibiotics, which means if we're talking wildlife, that's wildlife rehabilitators even if the bird can fly. Of course, if the bird can fly, you may not be able to catch it. The other thing that can happen is something called capture myopathy. So capture myopathy. Myo refers to muscle. Pathy is an abnormal condition. Think of pathology or pathogen, anytime you see that path word, it's referring to something abnormal. Anytime you see myo, it's referring to muscle. So capture myopathy is a, um, it's induced by high levels of stress and it causes damage to the muscles. Capture myopathy occurs more often in certain species than in others, but um, it can be a killer. Often days after the event. And it's common in um, certain birds, but it's also common in deer. Um, and kangaroos and a couple of animals like that. Usually the kind of animals that we think of as prey species rather than predators. So it's not gonna be found in hawks and owls and that sort of stuff, but certainly smaller songbirds are much more likely to get capture myopathy. With capture myopathy, 
um, it's more likely if there is, <clears throat> excuse me, a long chase involved in catching the bird. So if you're chasing a bird all around your backyard and you can't catch it, and it's you've been chasing it for five minutes, you need to stop. Because just the stress of chasing the bird can at that point start to be uh, life-threatening. Okay, so screenshot if you want this. Questions on capture myopathy? If you end up working with exotic animals of any kind, this is something really important to consider. It's something to be very aware of. Faith, go ahead. So this actually um, this actually explains um this actually explains what I've seen in, in um this actually explains what I've seen in shows like Northwood's Law, where game wardens respond to wild animals like that are stuck on someone's property. They try to cap they try to capture them as quickly as possible to avoid overstressing them. And oftentimes they'll be taking small breaks in between. Oftentimes they'll be taking small breaks in between, like trying to get them into, you know, trying to like get them into the trap yep and so that that's yeah I, i'm assuming that's why they, i'm assuming that's why they do that that's absolutely what's going on there and what i haven't seen on those shows but which does happen is sometimes if a species like deer that are very likely to get capture myopathy has been, let's say it fell through the ice into cold water and it's been struggling trying to get out for long periods of time. Sometimes they will choose to euthanize the animal, even if they can get it out because capture myopathy um, will kill it within a few days. Same thing with deer that break into a building, you know, they jump through a glass window or a glass door and end up tearing around a grocery store or something. Um, if they've been in there a long period of time, sometimes uh, the rangers will choose to euthanize it rather than, than release it because they know that, you know, releasing it is not necessarily going to have a happy ending for the deer. People don't like that, but Sometimes euthanasia is better than the alternative. All right, I'm gonna clear this. Okay, so. Most cat species have a significant prey drive. Yes, most cat species do have a very significant prey drive. Even if they're fed, it's, it's a game, right? It's fun. Speaking of cats. All right, so what other kinds of diseases might you spot in wild birds? I'm gonna mention just a couple. Over here on the left, this bird has a couple of warty looking growths on its face. That's avian pox. It is very common and it rarely causes death. So it's kind of like chicken pox before we had a vaccine. Most people would get chicken pox as a kid. Most kids, it's just an annoyance. Avian pox is kind of the same way. Lots of birds will get it it's usually not a real big problem for them. It is contagious to other birds, but it is not contagious to humans. So if you see wild birds coming to a bird feeder that have this kind of growth on the face, it's a good idea to take down your feeders, clean them really good, 
and leave them down for about two weeks so that the, the pox, the birds with pox can spread out and are less likely to spread it. Avian influenza is going around right now. It is the flu. It is more common in water birds and it definitely impacts uh, domestic chickens. Most of the time, avian influenza causes a relatively mild disease. This year, there's a more deadly strain going around. When that happens, you see a huge mortality in poultry. So I think I was seeing um, Iowa is being hit particularly hard and has euthanized tens of thousands of chickens because of avian influenza. It is possible, but very rare for this to spread to humans. Now, I'm gonna put a big asterisk right here. And I'm gonna add the word directly. So if you were to find a bird that has avian influenza, pick it up, take it to a wildlife rehabilitator, you're not likely to get avian influenza. If you're immunocompromised, that might happen, but it's extremely rare. I mean, to the point where there's only a couple of hundred cases worldwide that have ever been reported as possibly being direct from a bird to a person. And I think all of those were in poultry workers, but I, there may be one or two that, that uh, are exceptions to that rule. Now, what can happen is something very weird. Pigs can get avian influenza. Pigs can also get Could that cause an even bigger meat shortage? Uh, yes, Faith, unfortunately that can. Um, in fact, that, as far as I know, that is the reason there is a shortage of um, chicken and egg prices going up. Um, I think that that's the only thing I know of that's actually causing a shortage at this point. Largely it's, oh, hey, we've got a lot of avian influenza, therefore we can jack up the prices. Okay, going back to the pigs. Pigs can catch avian influenza. They can catch human flu, and there is a pig version of the flu. They can catch all of these diseases. And if they get two different types of flu, say they have the pig flu, which doesn't cause a lot of symptoms in pigs, and they get avian influenza, which doesn't cause a lot of cases in pigs, these three very different viruses can have a recombination. And so genes from the avian influenza and genes from human influenza or pig influenza can end up in the same virus. And that, when that happens, we get new strains that can often be much more severe than our typical flu. Um, and flu is, is nothing to laugh at in humans. It does kill between 30 and 50,000 Americans every winter. So these recombinations though, make those mortality numbers go up. They often make a more severe disease. Um, that's if they can, okay, yeah, we'll just leave it at that. Do you guys understand that or should I go to the whiteboard and try and draw that? I have one understood. 
Can humans get that recombination? Yes. Yes, they can. Okay, so when we have outbreaks that are called avian flu, it is a recombined version of avian flu that's combined with either human or pig flu. And that becomes contagious to us. Yeah. All right, I need to clear this little box. So if you want a screenshot. All right, so the bird on the right has finch conjunctivitis or house finch eye disease. You can see his eye is, his eyelid is red, it's swollen, it's shut. It's often crusty looking, really gross looking. So red, runny, crusty eyes. The eyes can swell and this can cause blindness. Generally speaking, um, many of these infected birds will die either of starvation because they can't find food because they are blind or they'll be attacked by a predator that they can't avoid because they're blinded. If you see finches with this kind of uh, closed eye situation, feeders down for two weeks. Clean them really good with bleach. Generally, when house finch conjunctivitis is going through an area, Local organizations are often interested in hearing about these cases, but figuring out who those organizations in your area are and how to report this can be a little tricky. So you can look on your local fish and wildlife, um, your state fish and wildlife or fish and game or game and fish or you know some combination of those two words. Look on their website and see if they want you to report it to them. Okay, any other questions about wild bird diseases? These are really the ones that we tend to see most commonly. All right, hopefully grab your screenshot real quick and we will move on to the next topic. Can I explain the recombination again? Absolutely, let me go to the whiteboard. This might be a little bit easier. Okay, so. Avian flu, this circle represents avian flu. And these little lines are avian flu genes. This circle, let's call this human flu and we'll make some human flu genes. And then this circle, we'll make this pig flu. And we'll draw some pig flu genes. Okay, now, avian flu, can infect birds and pigs. Doesn't usually spread to humans. Human flu can infect humans and pigs. 
not usually birds. Pig flu can infect humans, pigs, and birds, I think. Big question mark there. So what do we see in common? All of these can be caught by pigs. So I'm going to pig. Little piggy curly tail, some big floppy pig ears. Okay, so this pig gets infected by, let's say, a pig flu and an avian flu. So it's got both of these types of flu in it. And what results is a strain of flu that has some genes from the bird flu and some genes from the pig flu. And this, it turns out, can now infect people. This could also happen if the pig has human flu and avian flu or human flu and pig flu. Pigs can get all three of these and when they get infected by any two different types of flu, you get a new type of flu virus with combination of genes. Does that help clear that up, Abigail? This does not include avian pox. This is always flu. It's just flu. All right, so if you want to see, take a picture of how badly I can draw a pig on the whiteboard, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, and some of you are self-conscious about coloring on the pictures. Shouldn't be, it's hard to do. Okay, next topic. So we're again talking about wild birds and we're gonna talk more about wild birds. We're gonna talk some about wildlife rehab. I think that's next week. But today I wanna talk about, I wanna start talking about bird banding. This is sometimes also called bird ringing. Like you put a ring on, on the, a finger if you like it, anybody catch that one? Okay, good, thank you. I wasn't sure if that song was too old now. So um, this is when you put a permanent metal band on the bird's leg. Each band has a unique identification number on it. So this one says 2406. There's probably more number around the edges. This is the only bird that's going to have that number. These are used for scientific research. So scientists can do something that's called, um, they can use this information to study population size, migration patterns, survival and longevity, how long birds live, and sometimes for disease research. So, When we look at a population, 
Say you're wanting to look, oh shoot, this is a warbler, but I couldn't tell you which one. You're looking at warbler populations. You can catch a whole bunch of birds of the same species, band them, and then set up nets to catch the same species again, say a week later. And you can do some statistics to kind of get an estimate of how big the population is based on how many birds you banded and how many of the birds that you captured the second time had bands on them. So if you've got a very large population and you band a hundred birds, and when you recapture, you, you go out and you try and catch bird, the same species again in two weeks, you only get one bird with a band, but you got another hundred birds, that tells you the population is pretty big. Whereas if you band a hundred birds, two weeks later, you do another set of captures and out of a hundred birds, 95 of them have bands that tells you that the population is pretty small because you've recaptured a lot of the same birds. There's some fancy math involved, but that's one of the things that we talk about or, or that we use this bird banding for. These numbers, these, these bands can also be used for life expectancy. So, People have been banding birds for decades. And if you band a bird and 10 years from now, somebody finds that bird and it's dead, they can look at that band, report it. And I'm going to explain about the reporting part. Report the band number and you can say, okay, so that bird survived at least 10 years. And we can use this to get an idea of life expectancy. How long can these birds live? There's an albatross, I think I've talked about her before, named Wisdom, who was banded, oh shoot, she's in her 60s, 60s, late 60s now. So the first, she was banded for the first time over 60 years ago. We had no clue that albatross lived that long. We still have no idea how long they have the potential to live. She's still raising chicks, but we now have a better understanding of that. We can also use these bands if we use, so, so these are the, these metal bands are issued by the US Geological Survey, survey which is kind of weird. Um, there are also bands that are colored like these guys. And when you have these colored bands, these are called field bands. These are easy to spot in the field and they're often used for um, studies like who's mating or nesting, I should say, with whom. Um, who's interacting with who. How much, how uh, faithful birds are being. So until we really started studying this, especially once we were able to start doing genetic analysis and, and take blood samples. We thought a lot of bird species were very faithful to their partners. I'm building a nest with you. We're raising our children together. Yeah. <laughs> it turns out there's a lot of cheating going on in the bird world. We didn't know that before we started doing this research. Now it turns out that he's off sneaking in, sneaking it to the neighbor so that the neighbor um, and her boyfriend or husband or whatever you wanna use for your term here, 
her mate, are raising his chicks while his mate is off breeding with a guy from over here so that her offspring have more genetic diversity. Yeah, it's rampant. We can also look at how territorial are they? Are we seeing mixing of different birds or is one bird owning the territory and keeping all the others out? Hey, those, go ahead. Hmm. Yes, yeah, so um yeah, that's actually um that's actually that's in, that's um that's interesting because when I was um researching barn owls for my project, mm -hmm. I learned that um and this was from the um this was from um this was from Cornell University. This was I learned that um while males will well once a pair forms, males will protect their nesting site. They won't, they're not as territorial over their hunting grounds. So multiple pairs might inhabit the same hunting grounds. At, so multiple pairs may inhabit the same hunting grounds at different times. Yeah, cool. Yeah, things are always a little more complex out there in the real world than we expected. Cornell's a great site. If you're still working on your project and looking for information, Cornell's um, Lab of Ornithology has some really good information out there. Okay, um, this can also be used to determine who's doing what with nesting and rearing chicks. So if we look at these Canada geese, I can't tell males from females by looking. I don't think anybody can. They all look very similar to each other. So if we wanna know, is the male participating in building the nest and sitting on the eggs and rearing the chicks, we have to band them. And it's much easier to read this kind of band than this little metal band. So there are, Lots and oh, Mary, go ahead. Did they choke? No. I know it looks like it, but it's really not that tight around there. Birds, um, a lot of the 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 body that you see is just feathers. They're much much smaller underneath all those feathers. All underneath all those feathers. Sometimes you may also see die marks. A lot of times when people are actively banding birds, um, depending on the trap that they have set up, they'll put die marks on birds so that if the bird enters the trap again, they won't close the trap to catch that bird because they're like, oh, I've already handled that one today. I don't need to handle that one again. Um, those are temporary. Sometimes if you see yellow, like on the bird's face, like right above the beak, uh, that is pollen. And that bird has been eating nectar out of a flower. All right. So I'm going to clear this. All right. So the US Geological Survey. That just seems weird, right? Uh, but they are the group who issues permits band birds, and they issue the bands. Bands come in lots of different sizes. They're designed for the different sized birds. So 
this might fit on a hummingbird, but that's this one back here isn't. The bird that this one fits on, probably a hawk, you can't put a hummingbird size band on it. So they have to be species specific sizing. There are, as with everything we've talked about, lots of limitations on who's allowed to band birds. Now, I wanted to mention that there are other types of bands out there. So if we're talking on native wildlife, this is the USGS regulated banding. But pigeons may have bands issued by the American Racing Pigeon Union. So, oops. So, if you see a pigeon with a band, it's most likely a pet or a racing bird, and that band is used to identify it during competitions. There might be state issued bands for turkeys, prairie, prairie chickens. How do I spell prairie? Quail. Um, often these are associated with stocking or hunting. So whether you are aware of it or not, a lot of states release animals into the wild specifically to increase the population for hunting and for fishing. So if you are in a state that releases wild turkeys specifically to increase the population to, for hunters, those turkeys will be banded. Ditto prairie chickens, quail, um, generally speaking, as far as I know, ducks are not released this way, but the ducks, duck populations, most species are in pretty good shape. There can also be foreign issued bands. So the United, the US Geological Survey regulates bird banding in the United States. If you live in Canada, you're gonna have to deal with, I don't know who regulates banding in Canada. Somebody else regulates banding in Mexico. If you find a bird with a foreign issued band, you can report that band to the USGS. All bands on wild birds can be reported to the USGS. And that's the bird banding laboratory. Falconry birds will also be banded, and that's a different kind of band. Cage birds may be banded as well, but that is not regulated. It used to be when it was legal to sell wild caught birds that you would see a metal band that didn't have any numbers on it. And instead of being kind of straight like this, it was uh, more donut shaped. And that was to mark that that was a wild caught bird. So you may see some older parrots with those kinds of bands. Um, but a lot of breeders will band their birds. No regulation there. Okay. You want a screenshot? Go ahead. So let's go through the legalities. 
federal banding permits are valid for three years. You may need state specific or site specific permits depending on where you're doing the banding. To get a band, to get a banding permit, um, it is required that you have years of apprenticeship under somebody else who has a banding permit, a detailed research plan. You can't just say, oh, I want to band some birds and see what happens. You have to be banding for a specific reason. The details of the banding has to be reported to the bird banding laboratory. So you can you can see there's a log book here behind this bird. That's going to have specific information that you have to put in, including the species, um, sex, if you can tell, age, if you can tell, the band number that you put on it, and as well as some other data that they require you to collect. All of these bands allow short-term handling must be less than 24 hours. So the 24 hours is pretty much there in case you catch a bird and it's like nine o'clock at night. And by the time you've uh, taken all your measurements and banded the bird, it's after dark and it's a day active bird. You don't wanna put it out there after dark. You can hold it overnight and release it in the morning. This does not allow taking of nesting materials or eggs, and it does not allow transporting birds. So you can't catch a bird on one site, use your bird banding permit and release it somewhere else. You have to release it where you caught it. So these birds you can see they're being banded right here. It's a nice little tit mouse. And yeah, that's another warbler. Okay, so screenshot if you want it. So how do we catch the birds? There are a lot of different techniques for catching birds, depending on what kind of bird you're trying to catch. This is what's called a mist net. The idea behind a mist net is you put it up in an open area near some bushes. So what you're catching are birds moving from this set of bushes across this open area to this set of bushes. You might notice that there's a, some lines going across here. The mist net, if you look at it from the side view, so here's the net and there's gonna be a series of pockets and the bird hits the net, the net and falls into the pocket and get stuck in the pocket. So it's not just getting tangled in the net, it's actually ending up between two pieces of netting to trap it. You can see this one, they've had a whole flock of, of something come through, I'm not quite sure what. Um, that is one way that we catch birds. There are also sparrow traps. Sparrow traps are metal boxes with a opening in the side. So 
it's a box. And then this side, there'll be an opening that has some um, chicken wire or metal mesh kind of stuff. The bird goes in here. There's a bowl of food here to attract the bird. It's much harder for the bird to find his way back out because the opening on the inside is smaller. It's easy for the bird to find their way in. There are specialized traps for hummingbirds. And people will often net, uh, band nestling. You can, if you know where a, a couple of birds are nesting, nestlings can be banded shortly before fledging. Remember, when a bird fledges or leaves the nest, they are basically adult size. So you're putting the leg band on a bird and the leg is basically the size that it's going to be. It's not going to outgrow that band. When you catch a bunch of birds, like you caught all these birds in this nest, uh, mist net, and you've got a backlog and you've got to process them all, people often hang them in cloth or paper bags. It's a nice soft container um, that can hold the bird while, you're, while it's waiting to be processed. I see the question. I'm going to get back to that in just a second. Um, all of these types of capture must be monitored. So mist nets, people walk along the mist nets every, you know, maybe depending on how many birds are around, they may monitor these mist nets constantly, or they may go walk along them uh, every 15 minutes or so. Or so. Um, hummingbird traps, you have to watch those. Why would we band nestlings? Same reasons we would band adults. If you want to know how long a species can live, nest them when they're nestlings or band them when they're nestlings, you know that those were born this year. So that gives you a really good feel for that. Um, site fidelity, do they come back to the same location where they were born? Do they spend the second year of their life with their parents? Some species do that. We don't know that unless we band them. Okay. Questions on the type, the methods of catching birds. So when you catch birds, you're going to do data collection. You're not just gonna band them. If you've got the bird in your hand, you might as well collect some data. What data you collect depends partially on your research, um, but it can also be general information. So a lot of the information on those worksheets is general, things like, the size of the beak to the back of the head. That's a special measurement that we can take. We can take measurements on the size of certain feathers on the wings or the tail. So wing length, mass or the weight of the bird, uh, beak length, feather wear, do these feathers look old and worn out or has it freshly molted? Molted. Woo. Does it have a brood patch? What is a brood patch? This is a brood patch. When birds are nesting, they will have a spot on their belly where they lose a lot of their feathers. This means that that bare patch on their abdomen will be 
right next to the eggs or the newly hatched baby birds. And that allows for a better transfer of heat from the parent's body to the eggs or to the babies. So it's a better way to warm up the young, uh, young chicks. If you just had feathers, I mean, those feathers, they're insulators, remember? They're designed to prevent heat loss. So it's like, uh, it's like if you're trying to warm up a baby, but you've got a puffy coat on, and instead of putting the baby inside the coat, you just hold the baby to the outside of the coat. Some permits allow for blood or feather, oops, blood or feather samples. And this can be looking for looking at genetics. It can be looking at diseases. Um, genetics is one of those great things that we can use that we can find out that all of the birds cheat on each other. Yes, birds with a brood patch can still maintain their body temperature. It's harder, it takes more calories for them to do it, but they can do it. And this person right here is your fearless avian science professor, taking measurements of goals. Why do the two of us who are handling the goals have bicycle helmets? <laughs> Swooping, oh, poop shield, yeah. <laughs> yes, they fly down at us. They, they will um, peck you on the head. They will poop on you. Yeah, well, they're, they're going to attack you, but this way you don't, they don't uh, cut open your scalp. And they're funny. The place where we were doing these, this banding work, the gulls recognized us as individuals and they would attack us. There were other people who were not working on birds who were doing other research on the island. The gulls would leave them alone. They only went after those of us who were handling gulls. Okay, so if you want a screenshot, go ahead. How did we capture them? Oh, that's a great question, Fiona. They were nesting at the time of year that we were doing this. So we had a metal wire box that had one side open and we would put this metal box on top of their nest and they would come in the open side and sit down on their nest. And then we would sprint out of hiding and flip the box so the open side was down, <laughs> which sounds like it shouldn't work, but it actually worked pretty good. It just took a lot of, uh, lot of sprinting going on. <laughs> Yeah, it was always a workout. Um, I don't know what you mean, hole with a blanket over top with the treats. I know there's a type of animal trap where you can put something over a, a hole that you dug in the ground. That's not gonna work with birds because they can fly. All right. So I've mentioned this a couple of times. The USGS Bird Banding Laboratory um, keeps records of all birds banded. And bands found. So they're kind of the central repository for all this data. 
that data is available either on their website or by request. So if you are a researcher and you're wanting to know about uh, cedar waxwing migration, for example, and you want all of the data they have on banded cedar waxwings, you can request that. In addition to that, the original bander is notified uh, if a band is found or a banded bird is found. Now, how often are banded birds found? It's highly variable, usually very low or very few banded birds are recovered. If you've got a bird, a small songbird, and it flies over the uh, Gulf of Mexico during migration, and it doesn't make it, and it lands in the, Mex uh, the Gulf of Mexico, nobody's gonna recover that band. So if we're talking about songbirds, the rate of bands recovered is less than 1%. Birds that are hunted, especially things like ducks, it can be over 10%. Duck hunters are great about reporting banded birds. Um, and this is really useful. You can get a lot of useful information on these guys. So, If a band is reported, um, you find out where it was where the band was found, uh, by who the band was found, was the bird alive, what was the date the band was found. You can get all kinds of very useful information out of this. Okay, good grief. Questions on this? If you're interested, the Audubon Sanctuary at Joppa Flats sometimes allows people to visit the bird banding lab there. Um, and sometimes they allow volunteers. So if you're interested in learning more or seeing this in action, check out their website, see what's available. It's only seasonal, so it's not year round. It's only usually during spring and fall migration. All right, now I'm gonna clear the screen. And we don't have time to completely cover this, but let's introduce falconry. So this, is an eagle. You kind of get the idea now how big these birds can be. So this is, I believe this is a golden eagle, which are larger than the bald eagles. When we talk about falconry, we are talking about using raptors or birds of prey. Um, And, and when we, we're talking about these, we're talking about, there are lots, okay. Let me start this sentence over again. There are lots of birds that hunt for food that don't get included in birds of prey. So penguins, um, gulls, pelicans, storks, those sorts of birds do hunt other living things. We don't consider them raptors. So for it to be a raptor, it has to hunt for food, have good eyesight, strong feet, 
usually with strong curved talons and a strong, slightly curved beak that can be used to tear flesh. So if we think about penguins, pelicans, they tend to swallow their food whole. They don't tear it into pieces. Raptors or birds of prey tear their food into pieces. Okay, so if you want a quick screenshot of that. And we've, Faith, go ahead. So, um, this was uh this was last year this happened last year and um my mom this was this is something that my mom witnessed in our backyard so she found this enormous she found this huge hawk in our backyard that had caught a rabbit and it had and it had um it had eaten most of, and it had eaten most of the rabbit's head mm -hmm. and left like the rest of the, it had eaten most of the rabbit's head. It, it had torn most of the flesh off and left, and largely left the rest of the body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, brains are highly nutritious and a lot of animals will specifically target the heads um, for that nutrition. Yeah. Yeah, my mom was pretty traumatized by that. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be willing to bet that that bird was not as big as this one. It was probably a red-tailed hawk. Or great horned owl. Great horned owls are also good predators. All right. So the top, the hawk that took your duck left its head. Okay. That's kind of a surprise. Usually, oh God, your dog found it. Oh. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sure that was traumatizing. <laughs> All right. Oh, shoot. And on that cheerful note, I think we're going to stop. We're going to come back and talk a little bit more about falconry on Tuesday. If you don't have any questions, have a good weekend, everybody. Don't forget to turn in your project. Oh, it's Easter. Yes, have a good Easter. Sam, that would be fine. <laughs>